psalms, sonnets, and soliloquies. These are all forms of compressed, heightened, and dramatic language. They express specific situations, often of an intense emotional color, but they can be transferred to the experiences of other speakers and readers, endowing them with a kind of situated universality. Psalms belong to the context of prayer, both public and private. They're designed to be sung or chanted, and they often include some musical notations. Sonnets are a form of verse, sometimes also set to music, that emerged in the late Middle Ages and became the rage in the Renaissance. And soliloquies? They're dramatic speeches, usually written in blank verse, addressed by an actor to themselves, but also to the audience. And although they appear in the works of many dramatic artists, we tend to associate soliloquies with Shakespeare. So today, I will look at the formal characteristics shared by these forms and the way in which Psalms help shape the rise of the sonnet and the soliloquy in the Renaissance, culminating in Shakespeare. I hope you enjoy this tasting menu. The Psalms were divided by the rabbis into five books, whereas in the five books of Moses, God addressed Israel. In the five books of David, Israel addresses God. In the Middle Ages, which was a period of diaspora or galut for the Jews, the medieval rabbis read the Psalms as intending to comfort the people in exile with a strong messianic orientation. For Christians, that messianic orientation meant that the Psalms could be read as predicting the birth of Christ and the forms of mercy and redemption he was thought to bring. So the Psalms are deeply embedded in both Jewish and Christian liturgy, as well as daily practices of prayer. For Jews, the 150 chapters are grouped into seven portions so that the whole cycle of them can be read every week or divided into 30 portions so that they can be completed every month. Christians followed and still follow a similar process of daily recitation. The Benedictine rule, for example, dictated that monks recite the full cycle of Psalms every week. If we look at the English Book of Common Prayer, we see that the laity was expected to complete the whole cycle over the course of a month. Whether you're reading the Psalms on a weekly or monthly cycle, this is a pretty intense spiritual practice that takes the worshiper through a gamut of emotions and postures, from guilt and despondency to thanks and supplication, often running through the milestones of the history of Israel, including exodus, exile, and the dream of redemption, and also often cataloging the splendors of creation and praising God as the creator God. With the advent of the English Reformation and the new emphasis on reading the Bible in the vernacular rather than in Latin, there was a huge renaissance of Psalms translations. Some of these were official enterprises to be included in the new Reformed Bibles. Others were designed for singing in church or at home, and still others were literary experiments for personal use. The Book of Psalms, referred to as the Psalter, was also included in the Book of Common Prayer, which is really the Sidor and Moxor of the Anglican Church. Here is the first page of the Psalter in a Book of Common Prayer printed during Shakespeare's lifetime. You'll see a schedule for reading the Psalms, three in the morning and three in the evening. It's translated by Matthew Coverdale. Uh, Coverdale translated the Psalms in prose, but they're typeset as lines of verse, which is a nice echo, actually, of the Hebrew form. 
And the title of each psalm is given. These titles are taken from the opening words of the psalms, and they are provided in Latin, not in Hebrew or in English, which is interesting. So the psalms are easily the most familiar part of the Bible to English people in Shakespeare's time, readily available for reading, praying, singing, and meditation. The penitential psalms formed a special series of psalms and were sometimes bound or printed separately. And they were read as both a guide to penitence, somewhat differently for Catholics and Protestants, but maintained by both as a penitential sequence, but they were also read as a kind of novel, dramatizing the spiritual journey of David, especially around his seduction of Bathsheba and his um, essential murder of her husband Uriah by sending him to the front lines of a battle. This is a really interesting text. It's by a woman named Anne Locke, was published in 1560 and is called A Meditation of a Penitent Sinner. It's actually the first sonnet sequence in English. Anne Locke wrote 21 sonnets. All of them are paraphrases and expansions on Psalm 51, which is the most important of those seven penitential psalms. One thing that really interests me about Anne Locke is the deep early connection that we see here between psalms and sonnets. The two words were often presented as antonyms or opposites, since the sonnet is erotic and secular and the psalm is sacred and divine, but they could also present, be presented as synonyms. Both are lyric poems that share introspective themes, internal dialogues, and often very precise formal and thematic turns. Mary Sidney Herbert translated the Psalms into many metrical forms, including sonnets, with her brother, Sir Philip Sidney. In fact, this brother-sister pair of poets compared themselves to Moses and Miriam. A presentation copy of their Psalter was created for Queen Elizabeth in 1599. And you can see here how beautiful the calligraphy is. What I'd like to do now is look at a psalm, a sonnet, and a pair of soliloquies. This is Psalm 13. Let's listen together to the Hebrew. Lamnatseah mizmor le David. Ad anna Adonai tishkacheni netzah, ad anna tastir et panecha mimmenni, ad anna ashit etzot benafshi, yagon bilvavi yomam, ad anna yarum oyevi alai. Habita aneni Adonai Elohai, haira enai pen ishan hamavet. Pen yomar oyevi yecholtiv, tsarai yagilu ki emmot. Vaani behasdecha vatahti, yagel libi bishuatecha. Ashir al Adonai ki gamal alai. And here is the opening of a musical setting, sung by the Wells Cathedral Choir, composed by Henry Smart in the 19th century. a little bit of a composition by Brahms for female chorus and orchestra.
And here is the psalm in Robert Alter's translation. Notice that it begins with the Davidic context and the musical setting. There are six verses in Hebrew. Alter arranges the psalm into two stanzas, 12 lines total plus the preamble. And the kind of feeling of it, as well as the length of it, is kind of close to a Petrarchan sonnet, which was a 14-line form uh, composed for the Romance languages, especially Italian. And the Petrarchan sonnet consisted of one octet, or eight lines, and one sestet, or six lines. And you see the rhyme scheme here, in which the the poem kind of first folds in on itself with that A-B-B-A, A-B-B-A rhyme scheme, and then kind of has a beautiful um, trailing off quality with the C-D-E, C-D-E. The Petrarchan sonnet has fewer rhyme words than the Shakespearean sonnet. It has more infolding and echoing in the sounds which is very suitable for the Italian language. The Shakespearean sonnet has more variety in the rhyme words. We could say that it has more of a forward movement and less of a kind of self-enfolded and mirroring movement. And there's more sense of a closure to that narrative by ending with that couplet. So we kind of have in the Petrarchan sonnet an echo chamber or hall of mirrors versus in the Shakespearean sonnet, more of a little narrative. In both cases, we have an establishment of a problem, a situation that is troubling, burdensome, negative, and then a turn, sometimes called the volta, in which there is a solution to that problem. So we're going to read Psalm 13 as if it were a Petrarchan sonnet. In lines one to five, the speaker feels abandoned by Adonai, by the Lord. He says that he feels sorry in my heart all day long. He is beset by enemies and he worries about what they are saying about him. There is a strong social dimension here a sense of being mocked, evaluated. He is concerned about what people think or what people say. The turn, the volta, occurs in line six. He decides to trust in God's kindness, has said, and he exalts in the promise of his own salvation. He promised us to sing to the Lord. And this is really a reference to the psalm itself as song and prayer. The psalm becomes the praise promised to God. And as we read the psalm with the psalmist, we're invited to trace a similar path from sorrow and alienation from God, but also from fellow humans, from the community, to a congregation of praise in response to God. The psalm has a dramatic quality. The speaker talks to himself in two voices, as we often do when we are conflicted about something and go down one path and then try to counter that path with some kind of alternative argument. And the psalms give us a template for that kind of reasoning. There are two voices in this rubric as well. The figure who sits, who broods, who is troubled, and the figure who sings, who performs, who who responds, perhaps like Nathan the prophet in the story of David. So what about Shakespeare and the Psalms? Needless to say, because the Psalms were everywhere in the culture, they are everywhere in Shakespeare. And I'm less interested in highly specific references to the Psalms than in patterns of meaning and dramatic soliloquizing that we could say are psalmic or psalm-like. 
Let's start with the sonnets. Just as the book of Psalms has been read in relationship to the biography of David, Shakespeare's sonnets have been read as a kind of novel involving the speaker, a version of Shakespeare himself, a young man of noble birth uh, to whom he is devoted and in love, and a dark lady whom he also loves and who seems to be dallying with that young man. So we have this kind of narrative structure, but at the same time, the sonnets are also individual pieces, individual emotional and poetic compositions that like the mana in the desert can be transferred to the experience of the individual reader. Just as the Psalms became a template for the reader's own emotional and spiritual work. Let's check out Sonnet 29. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet in these thoughts, myself almost despising, haply I think on thee, and then my state, like to the lark, at break of day arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. This sounds a lot like the despondent singer of many of the Psalms, including Psalm 13. The speaker is full of sorrow, he beweeps his fate, and he feels outcast or excluded from the larger community. He also worries that his prayers are not being heard, right? That he's troubling deaf heaven with my bootless cries. This image of a God or heaven that has turned away its face, that is asleep, that is not listen listening, is a frequent image in the book of Psalms. And notice that he curses his fate. And this may be a reference to the book of Job where Job curses the day upon which he was born. That's the first quatrain. <laughs> In the second quatrain, he compares his situation unfavorably to others, similar to the enemies in Psalm 13 and the social world of envy and schadenfreude that they populate. And that keyword outcast, that word to me, has strong Old Testament resonances. It refers to or evokes the frequent experience of exile and wandering that is expressed in the Hebrew Bible and in the book of Psalms, especially after the, um, during the exile in Babylon. <clears throat> For example, in Psalm 147, quote, the Lord doth build up Jerusalem he gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. Uh, that's from the King James translation of Psalm 147. And the word outcast is also used by the prophets to describe the condition of exile suffered by the Jewish people. We have our Volta in the third quatrain. His spirits lift like a lark singing hymns in the morning at the gates of heaven. This is an image of praise song. There's a hint of the hallelujah psalms and of other psalms of praise, as well as the turn to praise that we see in the second half of Psalm 13. The book of Psalms in Hebrew is called Tehalim, which means praise, and praise is seen as the grace note of the Psalms taken as a whole. And that word hymn, which we see in Shakespeare, is sometimes used as a synonym for Psalm. 
in the English of Shakespeare's time. The lark is a morning bird. And I think that there is a sense in this sonnet of the kind of restlessness and anxiety of the night, of a kind of sleepless night, turning to the hope of the morning, signaled by the trills and rills of the lark greeting the sun. And I would compare this, for example, to Psalm 30, where the psalmist says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Psalm and sonnet play the circadian rhythms of the human heart. Psalms and sonnets are larks or lark spurs that prime the return of morning after the burdens of the night. And then we have that couplet, one of the most distinctive features of the Shakespearean sonnet. And in the couplet, he actually names the beloved, remembers the beloved as the solution to the burdens that have been weighing him down. Uh, I like the emphasis in the couplet on remembering. There is an act of reflection, of calling to mind, a mental exercise a process, and this remembrance brings him into contentment with his own state, which he says he would not change with kings. The reference to kings is interesting to consider in a Davidic context. The poem itself becomes the hymn sung by the lark, like the conclusion of Psalm 13, which ends, I will sing on to the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. The great Shakespeare scholar Stephen Booth comments, in lines 9 to 12, the beloved's love functions as the love of the deity does in Christian theology, right? So God is replaced by the beloved. And secular love poetry in the late Middle Ages and Renaissance was indeed often composed by transferring religious language from Psalms and elsewhere, including from sacraments, but replacing God with the beloved. For example, the famous sonnet in Romeo and Juliet, which the two lovers composed together uh, at the ball in the Capulet house, um, it really, that sonnet operates in a similar way. And there, Romeo compares himself to a pilgrim visiting the shrine of the saint and using the pilgrim's or palmer's kiss to first join hands and then lips with Juliet. And this reference to pilgrimage might be compared to the pilgrimage psalms, also called the gradual psalms or psalms of ascent of the book of psalms. So we can really see Sonnet 29 as a secular psalm, a psalm alchemically transformed into a love poem through very simple acts of translation and substitution that ripple through the lyric. In Sonnet 29, this technique of transmutation is very clear and forthright. We can really see what the poet is doing. A similar effect is achieved more subtly throughout the sonnets. For example, in Sonnet 30, which comes directly after. We'll just look at the, the opening quatrain here. When to the sessions of sweet silent thought I summon up remembrance of things past, I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought and with old woes new wail my dear time's waste. Right, so we have once again the sense of a brooding speaker um, who is uh, thinking about the past, perhaps obsessively uh, repeating what was good, which he has now lost. And it is um, both sweet, but there is also a sighing and a wailing um, a sense of, of burden 
and regret, as well as a kind of pleasure in memory and its poetic recreation. And we'll just switch down to the, to the couplet, which is part of the volta. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. Where we have the friend, the beloved, the young man coming in as a solution to that wailing and wasting. Now, in his account of the basic formal mechanism of Sonnet 29, in which religious language is converted to erotic and secular language, Stephen Booth refers to Christian theology. And that is certainly not wrong. Shakespeare was indeed a Christian. Yet the word outcast, which we connected to the images of the exile in both Psalms and prophets, along with the reference to the book of Job, recalls for me the Hebrew sources of Shakespeare's thinking here. In their turns and nods to Hebrew wisdom literature, Shakespeare's sonnets are Davidic and exilic. They're plaintive and messianic. Now let's talk about soliloquies. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, forgone all custom of exercise, and indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air. Look at this. Brave or hanging firmament, this majestical roof, fretted with golden fire. Why, it appears no other thing to me but a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason. How infinite in faculty. In form and moving, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. In apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world. The paragon of animals. And yet, to me, what is this? quintessence of dust. Man delights not me. Now, this is not actually a soliloquy uh, because he is addressing his friends and it is written in prose, not verse, but it has the effect of a little drosh or sermon that both addresses the speaker's own condition and points outward into a reflection on the nature of the human condition. It has long been considered a take on Psalm 8, which also praises God as the creator of the cosmos and places man just below the angels. Hamlet, however, doesn't stay on that joyous thought. He combines the optimism of Psalm 8 and also of much humanist writing of the period with the darker pessimism of Job and Ecclesiastes, also called Kohelet. Once again, Shakespeare finds himself very much at home in Hebrew wisdom literature, in both its praise song and its existential meditations. And here is a soliloquy that is in blank verse, Macbeth's Tomorrow, and Tomorrow and Tomorrow speech, delivered by Ian McKellen. Wherefore was that cry? The Queen, my lord, is dead. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. 
tomorrow. And tomorrow. And tomorrow. Creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life is but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour up on the stage. And then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. So there's probably a reference here to Psalm 90. The line, it is a tale told by an idiot, has been taken as an allusion to Psalm 90's, for all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. So a tale that is told in Psalm 90 is expanded, and we could say explained, paraphrased, and spelled out by Shakespeare in it is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And Psalm 90 implies something like that, right? That there is a vanity in our days. Our, our days are simply stories that disappear and that are not narrated by anyone with a sense of permanence, but it's very compacted and it's not um, specified in the psalm, exactly how that metaphor of life to tale should be understood. In both of the psalm and the soliloquy, there's a strong sense of guilt before God or oneself. And as a consequence of that guilt, an immersion in an understanding of the vanity and fleetingness of one's life, which becomes a mere story empty words told by others, told by others perhaps um, as gossip, um, as well as by, as, as foolishness, um, the tale told by an idiot. Think about that social dimension at the edges of Psalm 13 that we also saw in Sonnet 29, in which the speaker who is concerned with themselves is also reflecting on this social world um, that buzzes with, with negative energy, right? With bad vibes. He is sunk in the despondency of the speaker of Sonnet 27, but he doesn't have that lark-like couplet that would save and soar, right? There is no volta, there is no turn, there is no redemptive solution because Macbeth, is too much immersed in his secret sins, too much immersed in his iniquities to be able to find solace in a hereafter, uh, in a, a higher power that might redeem him. So tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow is almost a sonnet, but the lack of those final two sentences itself reveals so much about where Macbeth is at this point in his life's journey. So I hope you've enjoyed this brief dive into Psalms, sonnets, and soliloquies. And I look forward to your comments and questions, as well as to more opportunities to learn with you.